So hello everyone, I'm uh, Bradley Sumrall, curator of the collection from the, for the Ogden Museum of Southern Art in New Orleans. Um, and I'm here with Christian Din. Um, we are recording this curated conversation uh, with Christian on Chittimacha land in the great city of New Orleans on April 22nd in the year 2021. Um, thank you, Christian, for being here with us. Thank you. Uh, Christian is a New Orleans ceramicist, a New Orleans artist. Uh, and I first saw Christian's work a few years ago when Christian first came to uh, New Orleans, I believe from Pensacola. And I liked the work, it was powerful work, uh, but I've recently uh, been uh, given the opportunity to see a new body of work that he's uh, building and he's really, it's really next level. Uh, so that's what we're really here to talk about today is this new body of work from New Orleans artist Christian Din. Um, so before we get into that, I'd like to uh, give you the opportunity to give everyone a little background. Um, tell us a little about your history um, and the, especially your history as an artist. Okay, yeah. So I actually didn't get into art making until a little bit later in life. I actually studied music for a long time. I went into undergrad as a classical guitar major, actually. And so like, I, I used to play classical guitar, like very, I don't know, very religiously. It was, it was very stiff in a way, I guess, compared to what I've been doing now. But I actually used to practice like so much that I developed tendonitis in both of my hands. Mm. from the fingertips all the way up to probably close to my shoulders and both arms mm. and so that like stopped me from playing like completely there's just I couldn't use my hands for almost it was almost two years actually wow. and so yeah that and I tried to maybe about a year in try to pick up the guitar again but there's just absolutely no way I could play at the same level I, as I once did so I was in undergrad and I really didn't want to take a break because I was already two years in, but I was trying to fumble around different courses and classes to see what I wanted to do. And I ended up just taking a darkroom photography mm. class as like a um, elective class. It wasn't serious or anything like that, but I used to actually do photography when I was like a teenager but nothing so seriously. I never really thought of it as art. I didn't really have that concept of art or fine art at the time. It was just something I did for fun. But when I got into dark room, I completely fell in love. Mainly, it was more so, I, I love the medium itself of photography, but it was the, my peers and professors that I met at the time. They were so inspirational to me. I just never been surrounded by artists that were so like, motivating and that really kept me going i i took all the darkroom courses and eventually just switched my major over to fine arts but from there i couldn't get enough i wanted to do more i, I started taking all the courses all the painting courses all the sculpture courses and it was just it was a whole new world to me it, it made me completely think differently on how I created. It was probably the most important moment in my career it was the very beginning, I would have to say. Mm. But ceramics was also, I guess, like a surprise to me. It wasn't something I thought that I would be so passionate about. I took it again as like a in my senior year of undergrad as an elective thinking, oh, I just do like a, a wheel throwing course. And it's gonna be like a nice leisurely course that can make some pottery. But there I actually met one of my most influential professors, Dryden Wells. He mm -hmm. is a potter from, oh, shooting a blank. I think <laughs> he's gonna, I think it's uh, from, He's, I think he's from Missouri. Um, oh, I'm, I'm butchering this. But he actually, he studied in Jindijing, China, where they do a lot of production Chinese pottery. 
And so he it really influenced me and showed me the whole new world of ceramics of, of, of production pottery and how much labor goes into it and how community based it is of that each person in the community do, does uh, specific aspects of the pottery and really like a piece of pottery could have dozens and dozens of hands that had worked on it from beginning to end. And so mm. it, it changed my perspective on how I work and, and how repetition and multiplicity plays a role in my work, that it's different than maybe like a Western perspective of uh, the singularity of artwork but really the multiplicity and on all the nuance that is in between all the variations. It, mm. it, it's a different way of contemplation to me where it takes true contemplation to really see those nuances and see the different variations between two things that are virtually the same. And so I, that has played a big influential role in my art making. And mm. that's from there where I, kind of fell in love with ceramics and how I'm here today, still studying it. Was it something about the alchemy of photography that drew it to drew you to that? And do you find those similarities in ceramics with kind of the, the, the from the dark room to the glazing process, you know, uh, that kind of magic yeah. that happens with it, whether you're developing film or you're uh -huh. uh, pulling something out of the kiln and seeing the colors that you've achieved. First time. Yeah, it's it's so true. It's almost like a you know you these things you could be so technically sound and know the material so well, but it's still like that chemical reaction of the mm -hmm. of the fixative or the chemical reaction of glaze being put into fire is just still so just amazing to me. It just it's unexplainable no matter how much I study it. Yeah. Yeah, and it's those two mediums are so different from, say, painting or drawing, which is immediate and happens right in front of you. There's like uh -huh. this, there's this tension of waiting to see what the outcome is going to be once you pull it out of the, out of the dark room or out of the uh, uh, uh -huh. kiln, you know. It's, yeah, it's, it's always a surprise. I, I would have to say that all my work, I, I really don't know what it's going to look like until it's finally done. Hmm. Well, um, and it's beautiful work. So uh, why don't we dig into a little of um, of this body of work. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. Um, let's see. And so, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> From beginning, there we go. Okay, so the first piece, well, I figured we'd start with the two vessels first and then go into the other work. Um, so tell us about this first, this first vessel. So this first vessel is actually a take on traditional Chinese blue and white pottery, but also it, it's not really known, but Vietnam was also producing a lot of blue and white pottery that Historically, it's funny, historically has the Vietnamese pottery was seen as Chinese pottery. It was uh, commonly confused as Chinese pottery, which I, I, it's a, a theme in a lot of my work of this, this overtone of Chinese culture on Vietnamese culture, mm. which it, I find really interesting that, oh, of course, like Vietnam was under Chinese rule historically for a long time. And it's taken a lot of the influence from China, not necessarily, of course, like the country and the people wanted to be independent on their own, but the traditions and cultures and influence still stick with the people and they embrace it. They, they, don't, they don't have n negative feelings towards this identity of theirs, but it's something that they accept and exist with. I think uh, from an outsider's perspective of the Vietnamese, just looking through food, it seems like there were conquerors uh, there was, that influenced the culture. And then when they were gone, the Vietnamese food just kept the best, the things that worked for them. You know? <laughs> like, exactly. French or Chinese, you know, and uh -huh. it, it all went into creating something that's bigger uh, than its individual parts. Total, total transparency, Vietnamese 
cuisine is some of my favorite food in the entire world. So, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. But it yeah. seems to me like also in their in their pottery traditions, maybe it, they did something uh -huh. similar. It took the very best uh -huh. and, then, and then tossed out the rest. Exactly. They don't, they, it seems to me the tradition is like they don't disregard those things in the past. They, they take it and embrace it. And it's almost like this overlapping of cultures and how, how they exist with them. And so the idea for this is, um, is similar to where I wanted to do traditional blue and white pottery, but in the context of Asian American society. And so a lot of what I've been talking about in my work is how Asian American society is, it's a, a newer, culture it's a uh, it doesn't have these hundreds of years of tradition and um authenticity that vietnam or china has but it's been around in the u.s and established so much in the short amount of time here and it's developed this whole new beautiful culture in the u.s and in my work in these vases specifically i want to authentify the Asian American culture and, and solidify its traditions as, as a, its own standing culture in the US. And so these pieces I was working on using traditional techniques with newer content that kind of presents very, I guess, maybe like idiosyncratic things in US or in Asian American culture that I have found to be prominent in my life. And this piece itself actually is about shrimp paste. Mm. It's, um, it's the Kun Chung shrimp paste bottle brand that I grew up using. And so the idea is that these products, it's something that I'm so familiar with. My family use it, uses it all the time and has throughout my entire life. And, you know, it's the product I don't really think of. I just thought of it as like a, oh yes, this is a, a Vietnamese, this is an Asian product. But really when you look into it, it's an Americanized Asian product. Similar, it was, it's created here, I believe in, in California, mm. but it, I don't disregard it as being inauthentic. It's something mm. that I grew up with and I, I know the taste, I know how to use it. It's something that I love. And, and so with this, I want to bring that into its own tradition of Asian American culture and saying that it's not just this Americanized product, but a product that I grew up with and that is a, a symbol of Asian American culture. So what elements of the vase actually mimic uh, the product? Is it just the graphics? Is it the form? Is it the lettering? It, it's, it's the lettering itself. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely the lettering itself. And the other aspects of it are kind of my take on motifs of traditional blue and white pottery. Mm -hmm. It's um, kind of like floral patterns that you'd see that are very traditional, like the way of like their arrangement and composition. And then the kind of the arcing windows around it is another motif that is like very common. But yeah, the, it's mainly the text. The shape itself is actually, it, it's a, a, a shape that I took, that I copied from a Vietnamese pot that has a, pretty interesting history itself actually. So I think the story goes that in the early 1900s, there was this vessel, like this beautiful vessel that was discovered and there was a text on the side of it that was translated in Chinese. And for a long time, they thought that the piece itself was made in a district in China, but no one really questioned that until someone looked at the vase and reinterpreted it and realized that these characters in Chinese don't really make sense. It, it's just words placed next to each other if it was, if it was in Chinese. And so they, they 
reevaluated the vase and tried to figure out what it could mean. And they found out that the characters in Vietnamese actually was a woman's name in a small village. And so um, they, tr they brought the vase, or they, they went to the village in Vietnam and tried to find out if anyone knew of this potter. And the city itself didn't know due to like, um, I think, I think maybe during, during the, a war, the village got destroyed or the, the factories where they were producing ceramics were destroyed. So the city, the people in the city themselves didn't know that there was ceramics being produced there. But until like, I, I guess they found a shipwreck and maybe some old ruins where they found pottery with the same um, characters on it. And that's where they made the connection. And so that's kind of the theme that was going with these pots is this confusion or overtones of like um, Chinese influence over Vietnamese influence or the misunderstanding of the two cultures. Right, yeah, sorry, I, I, I ran forward, but I, this is beautiful and I love the shrimp. It's so beautiful, the shrimp head itself. Thank you. Um, the glazing is really, really beautiful. And the, the floral work uh, above those bay windows, um, it looks to me in, in, in a cursory glance uh, like cilantro. <laughs> it actually is cilantro. <laughs> oh, very good. <laughs> you got to have it. I mean, it's, it's something I, I eat it with every meal. <laughs> yeah. I grow it half the year in my backyard myself. Um, so. Well, let's move on to the next uh, vase, uh, the takeout vase. Yeah, so this work is, it's similar in the concepts as the first one, but this is, um, this one is about Chinese takeout food mm. and kind of how I see it as, <laughs> it, I really kind of see it as like a comfort food. You know, it gives me a sense of home. And I, I know that it's not, it's not like authentic Chinese food, of course, it's, it's completely different, but it goes along the same lines of it's, it's an American Chinese food. And it, it's an industry that many Chinese immigrants, many Vietnamese immigrants, a lot of different Asian cultures work in these industries. And it's become uh, a, a place of work for a lot of immigrants, a, a place where they can provide for their families and a place where they know they can work. And so I, I see that there's always a lot of stigma against Chinese takeout. A lot of people think it's, I don't know there's a lot of negative things that go towards Chinese takeout, but not to me, I find it as, something that is comforting and it gives me a sense of home and nostalgia and so this is the imagery is actually from a chinese takeout box it's just my interpretations of it mm. Mm -hmm. it's beautiful all right well let's get into the next um forms which are these hands all right okay uh, i believe how many uh, we're gonna i believe we're gonna look at five today maybe um, of, of, of these hands, so. Okay. Yeah, so this is um, the main body of work, or the main series I've been working on currently, and this is uh, the Nail Salon series, and this was probably the first piece that I made in this new body of work that I'm making, and so the Nail Salon series is my interpretation of the success of the Vietnamese nail salon. The, similar to Chinese takeout, the nail salons are an industry that have a lot of stigma against them, against Asian workers, and it's seen as a low class immigrant work. And I completely see it differently. I see it as probably the great success of the Vietnamese American culture. The industry itself, I mean, in the re Vietnamese refugees who came here after the war found themselves taking, being able to get jobs in the nail salon industry because of the low English profi proficiency. 
And so they were able to just communicate just very little and work in US society. But since the 70s till now, the Vietnamese community has completely dominated the nail industry. They've changed it into something completely of their own. And that is just truly a great success story to me. And in Vietnam, when I first went there, they told me that the ant was symbolic of the Vietnamese people because the ant works together as a unit to create um, success. And that's how I see those ideals translating still over to Vietnamese American culture. I see the success of the Vietnamese nail salon being success for the entire Vietnamese community, something that we could all be proud of. And I wanted to highlight and celebrate the success of the Vietnamese nail salons and the Vietnamese community. And so on the hands themselves, I've depicted on them different ideals of success that I believe are in Vietnamese American society. And this first one being Tet. Tet, Chinese New Year, is, a, is of course celebrated all over Vietnam, all over Asia. But, and we celebrated here with the same ideas, but in a way, I think that it takes on new meaning also as a celebration of freedom after the Vietnamese had come here after the war, it was the celebration was a way to bring the community that has been displaced in the US together and celebrate uh, a new beginning. And I think that's what the celebration takes on in the US to me. Mm. And uh, the VSOP. Um... <laughs> yeah. What is, what's that about? So the VSOP, it's also ties into the, uh, the idea of the overlapping of cultures. So the VSOP, the cognac um, was introduced to Vietnam when the, during the French occupation. Mm -hmm. And it was seen as something that only royalty can have. Like this was a, a drink for the higher class for royalty. It wasn't for the Vietnamese people. So once um, France was moved out of Vietnam, that idea was still kept in Vietnamese culture. To give a gift of VSOP is uh, very traditional during Tet. You would typically mm. give that to an elder or someone you respect. It is still seen as like, I guess, uh, a high class gift for for people of high respect to you, not necessarily uh, to class or um, wealth or anything, but respect of someone you hold at high regards. Mm. And so that's what the VSOP means. Uh, the next one is French tip. Right, yeah. So uh, going tying back into um, French influence, Catholicism, is uh, very big in what is very big in South Vietnam and the South Vietnamese who came here to the US. And so during the Vietnam War and prior, it was uh, suppressed. At, they, they didn't want Catholicism in Vietnam to a degree, I believe, that's from my understanding. And so what I see it here in the US, even though, of course, like, being displaced from your country and having to be refugees is, is not a good thing. But to look at it in another light, it was an opportunity of this freedom of religion to come here and be able to uh, express your religion, to, to embrace Catholicism where no one would stop you. And so I, I see it also as a, a great success for the Vietnamese community because many of the Vietnamese community here are Catholic. And so that's uh, the, the idea behind this piece. Was the, from my understanding, the Catholic church was deeply involved 
post-war in the resettlement of refugees throughout the United States. Um, I believe so, yes. In, uh, a lot in the South, um, here along the Gulf Coast, in Florida, where most of my family is. And then I believe there, I'm not 100%, but there is, they've, there's no, they're no, it's known as like a second wave of um, Vietnamese refugees. And it was a little bit more in the North, in Virginia, where uh, the other half of my family lives, I think in Washington. I'm not sure on the specifics, but yes, I, that's from my understanding too. So while we're on this piece in particular with the yellow silk, um, is did you choose the color to to uh, forward the narrative of these pieces of the, the the pillows that the hands are sitting on, or is it purely aesthetic? Um, I, I think I'm thinking yellow silk is usually very uh, tied with um, sexuality and sensuality, um, and yet this piece is about Catholicism, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, actually the 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 fabrics and the colors themselves, um, they're traditional Vietnamese fabrics uh, um, that you would see typically during like celebrations, like honorary celebrations of the Ao Dai is what you'd call them. You'd see them made out of gowns and, mm -hmm. and headdresses. And so the first two that we've seen red and gold, those two colors in Vietnamese culture are symbolic of uh, royalty okay. and happiness and prosperity. Um, yeah, and so that, that was why I chose these colors for the pillows themselves. They're to further elevate and emphasize this idea of celebration, the celebratory moment of the Vietnamese nail salon and the Vietnamese community. And symbols of success. Yes. yes. So um, this this piece with the the dollar bills. Tell us about this piece. Yeah, this one speaks to I guess the service industry of of the nail salon, but other uh, industries themselves of uh, this translation that you typically see. I guess these these service industries of the workers saying thank you a lot. There's always thank you printed on all the bags and, and all the, the little things that they give. And so on the nails themselves, it says gamong, which means thank you in Vietnamese. And the idea of it, it was um, how much the worth of a dollar is to, to like the, the lower or to the minority class of like, how important each dollar, every hour, every minute spent for in these service industries are for these people. Like the, my family, from my own experience growing up, worked all the time, every day, and just to provide for me. I, I feel like I grew up just completely different than how they did, and that they really put in so much work so I can just have this whole new experience than them. And so this piece is about how these service industries that usually have, you know, they're usually overlooked and seen as like lower class work, how every minute of these workers' lives and uh, how, min like how every minute of their lives counted to provide for their family and to provide for the success of the family unit as a whole. So. I love this piece. Thank you. Um, and I believe this might actually be the, the last uh, set yes. of hands. So um, aroma, which uh -huh. we, we've discussed this um, before, but this one had me very confused. <laughs> and I was just on my own without your own narrative. I was yeah. trying to, I just, and I never came to, came yeah. to it. And then- Yeah, this um, one's- uh... This one would be a little tricky to, to decipher, but this, to me, probably the most ultimate success for a Vietnamese family and the Vietnamese community is to sit at home and eat with your family. Like we were just saying earlier, the food culture, food is a very important part of a Vietnamese culture. And to be able to come home and eat with your family 
is, is probably one of the most important things I would have to say in Vietnamese culture. I think any time that I talk to my family on the phone, they care more about what I've eaten that day than anything else that I've ever done like in my whole life. So <laughs> it, it's very important. And so on this depicted are certain I, brandings or certain products that are also Vietnamese American products or Asian American products that I grew up with in, in my home on the hands going down are melamine chopstick designs that mm. I would have to say in all of my family's houses and all my friends' family's houses I went to, these were the specific chopsticks that you would find and that you'd be using to eat with. It's, I can't say that it was the whole community uses these chopsticks, but they were there in every single person's house that I went to have dinner with. So this item to me also brings a sense of nostalgia and the sense of home anytime I see this pair of chopsticks. And also along the same lines as that aroma is the rice cooker that I saw at all their houses. This was very important for rice is extremely important in Vietnamese culture. It's eaten with every meal. Um, the, it's, it's probably the most common thing that you would probably find in a Vietnamese household is the rice cooker. And it, it just brings the, it ties in the idea of um, the family coming around to all eat together. It's typically with the rice that's made. And so that's what this idea of this piece is, the, the success of the family being able to eat together. Mm, I love that. Uh, one uh, more question about the hands before we move on to the final piece. Um, did, are, did you create these hands from your mind or did someone you did you use someone's hands to cast uh, the forms <laughs> so i actually um i actually used um mannequin display hands that you typically mm. see at a nail salon ah. the the mannequin nail hand to me um represents a, the translator. This it's something that might be banal to anyone. It's just like a, something that no one really would think of. It's just this item that you'd see and just pass by every day. But to many of the people in the nail salon industry, it's been a means to communicate, to communicate the services and the products that they will will have, what they can offer. And it's, it has a lot of significance to them. And they use it as a, this tool um, for communication against language barriers. And so there's a lot of importance to me in the mannequin hand itself. And that's what, the reason why I decided to depict a mannequin hand instead of an actual hand. Mm, that makes a lot of sense. Um, OK, so the final piece in, in this presentation um, is this installation. Uh, yellow. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so this is uh, the second piece that is um, in this body of work of nail salon. And so typically when you go inside of a nail salon, beauty store that sells nail polish bottles, you see these, dis these displays with all these colors. And it's usually the what's in or well, this is what you need to buy for this month. And so I decided to take that idea and say that yellow is what is in. And um, the idea is off of the stereotype that all Asian people are yellow. And so with this idea, I wanted to redirect the stereotype and say that if Asian people are yellow, then yellow is beautiful. And that is what I have to offer. And this is the color that I want to elevate. And 
that is the idea of this piece. Mm. I love reclaiming um, stereotypes in that way and redirecting, uh, much like you said, um, Vietnamese culture would uh, take things and just absorb them and reclaim and make them their own. Um, uh, I think of the wonderful bread uh, that we have here in New Orleans from Dong Fong, the James Board, War, Beard Award winning Dong uh -huh. Fong. Uh, oh, it's you know, it's, it's a French style bread. Uh -huh. I learned from the French, but it's so much better <laughs> than the French bread that we get. Oh, so, it's great. Yeah, I love, I love this idea of reclaiming or claiming as your own uh, something that maybe someone was using wonderful and it's a powerful powerful body of work thank you thank you so much uh, thanks for creating it and thanks for sharing it with us today hopefully you'll see this work uh in the near future uh at the ogden museum of southern art but um before we i'm going to stop sharing the screen right now uh and just one final question maybe um just to give us a little idea of your process and, and where your head's at uh, are there any artists whether it's visual i know you're a musician so maybe musical uh -huh. or um that uh inspire your work inform your work or or help you to create your work yeah definitely well i guess speaking on this particular body of work there is there is a poet and writer ocean wrong do you know okay well we talked about this you know he's one of my favorite yeah. writers in the english language so <laughs> Uh, yes, <laughs> I, I think he is most definitely the most inspiring person right now to me. And when I started first making this work, I was a, I was a, a little afraid of making this work. Uh, I didn't really know how to go about it. I was nervous as uh, thinking that how can someone like me like speak on this and like represent my whole culture my whole community. I was afraid of letting them down, of like not doing a good job. And then when I showed someone the uh, first few iterations of the work, they they referred me to to look up Ocean Vong. And I was just, once I did, I just was, it floored. It completely changed my perspective and really encouraged me to keep going with the work. It's just his ideas are just brilliant. And he just, he says everything I want to say just so beautifully. It just it 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 moves me every time. And so I would at the current moment he's most definitely the most inspiring person to this body of work. Well, I definitely thought of uh, Ocean's work immediately uh, when when I saw your body of work, and I'm 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 very pleased to learn that uh, this body of work was developed outside of his influence, and that you could find such great resonance uh, with another with another artist's uh, words. Um, so I think I think they're equally powerful. Um, Thank you. And uh, I'm excited to share share more uh, as this body of work develops. So um, thank you for being with us today, Christian. Thank you. I really appreciate it. All right. You can learn more about Christian's work uh, at his website. You want to give him the website? I, the website is still under construction at the current wow. moment. <laughs> All right, well, to be announced, uh, but uh, hopefully soon you'll see more about Christian's work uh, at the Ogden and on the Ogden's website, www.ogdenmuseum.org. Um, and that's it, folks. Thanks, Christian. Thank you.